I miss his music, his laugh. I miss the three of us, me, Tommy, and John. I haven't laughed as hard since, you know, in the last 10 years. If you have nothing to hide, then stop hiding, David. We're not going away. As of last week, it has been 17 years for this missing persons investigation, and the family's being very clear. They don't think this is a missing persons investigation. They believe this is a homicide and should be treated as such. It's time to turn on the searchlight for John Spira. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. And a special thank you to fan of the show, Brian. He keeps me updated on many different missing persons investigations that are going on. And every now and then he asks for a little coverage, a little help on one of them. That is how I got to today's case. So big thank you to Brian for that. Let's take a look at the case of John Spira. Uh, a case which was covered on the first season of Disappeared. And I don't think I've given this rant on the channel in a while, but I think Disappeared is, if not the best, it's one of the best shows uh, on ID Network. So uh, my hat's always off to them. They do such wonderful work. But there is a little bit of a hiccup in that, in that when they do their work, it's a snapshot in time of the case. And effectively, this case was covered very early on. It was in the first season of Disappeared, and that was only a few years after John went missing. And there's been a lot of development since that really might change your perspective or maybe strengthen a perspective that you have from the Disappeared episode. So I wanted to go through all of the media, try to bring us up to current with this case, and see if there is some explanation that might make sense to all of you out there that are wondering about this case uh, that has now got my attention absolutely hooked. I just, I can't believe some of the developments that happen in this. And I can certainly understand why his family is so adamant that this is not a missing persons investigation. Um, they're, they're looking to bring John home for his burial. Um, but let's go ahead and start with the basics at NamUs. Date of last contact, February 23rd, 2007. Missing from Illinois. He was 45 years old at that time. He would be 62 years old today, standing at five feet, eight inches tall, weighing around 160 pounds, also known as Chicago Johnny, kind of a stage name. He was a guitarist as well. Uh, he's a white Caucasian male. So for the circumstances here, they note, it's interesting how they phrase this because I think they're really trying to call out um, his home location, which is the 3000 block of King Richard Circle, but they're saying he was actually last seen around 7 p.m. on February 23rd of 07 at his business, which was a company called Universal Cable Construction, and that's on County Farm Road in West Chicago. Uh, it does also note a, a family website that's been put together here. I don't believe it's functional anymore. I have been able to get to parts of it through archive.org. So I've done that to try to review some of their information. I'll kind of work some of that in as, as we're going through this today. Circumstance notes, although this case was originally filed with the St. Charles, Illinois Police Department, it is now categorized under the jurisdiction of the DuPage County Sheriff's Office for reason that Spira disappeared in an unincorporated area within the parameters of DuPage County. So Kind of easy to understand in terms of, you know, his home locations in one spot, his business locations in another, and it quickly becomes determined that he was actually last seen at work. So at that point, the missing person's case kind of transfers hands. Hair color, brown. It does note that he has a receding hairline or is balding. Uh, his eyes are hazel in color. No other real distinctive physical features noted here. They do have some clothing though. Black turtleneck sweater, blue jeans, an olive green flight jacket. This is a man that also loved aviation, had his pilot's license. And that's one of the theories that seemingly almost impedes the investigation at the start is you have this guy that could literally fly across, across the country. His sister actually talks about in one particular visit that he flew from Illinois all the way out to Arizona to see her in a small plane, probably something like a Cessna or something like that. 
So this is a guy that if he gets his hands on a plane, he could literally just take off and, and go disappear. And it really seems like some of the early investigators on this case are considering that heavily. And what's interesting about that is even, even in the disappeared episode, which like I said, is a snapshot of just a few years after, there's a lot to leave you questioning, like, why are we thinking about this so odd like this? I mean, yes, is it a consideration that should be left on the table? Maybe, but I don't think that I'd have it front and center of that table. I think there's a lot of other considerations here. He's going through a divorce at this time. He's literally been working two years at negotiating this divorce settlement. He has just finalized that on the day that he goes missing, which is interesting to me because if he, this was someone that wanted to leave his life behind or something like that, why is he even going to work at that and bring it to that point? Especially if he knows he's going to be taken off later that day. Why is he looking to kind of button things up in that way? And then he disappears and isn't effectively able to do the rest of what needs to be done around that. It's just, it's a bizarre circumstance for the thought of trying to figure out if this is someone that would leave their own life. Outside of that, this is a person that, like I said, loves music, has a band, plays locally all the time, uh, has multiple businesses that are doing well, although we're going to hear that maybe one of them is, is having some specific challenges. Um, but this is a guy that has resources. He's dating. He's, you know, he's living with his wife, which is kind of a tense situation. They're living in the same house together, apparently on different floors. But he's in the dating world. He has an active nightlife. Why is he going to just up and leave all that? It's a really, really big question. And like I said, leave it on the table for consideration. But as much focus as it seems to get early on in the investigation, it just kind of makes you wonder what's what's happening with it. And of course, helps you understand the, the family's frustration. Uh, black shoes for footwear and a Rolex watch for jewelry. Uh, also not noted here, but there is a cell phone that's part of this story as well. Uh, they are noting here in terms of vehicles that both of his vehicles were accounted for. Some interesting considerations with one of those vehicles that we're going to touch on. But what happened to John all those years ago? And why is his family sitting here 17 years later without the answers? Let's learn about where this is taking place. And that is in West Chicago, Illinois. West Chicago is a city in DuPage County, Illinois, United States. The population was over 25,000 as of the 2020 census, pretty similar population back when he went missing. The city was initially established around the first junction of railroad lines in Illinois, and today is still served by the Union Pacific West Metro Service via West Chicago Station. So just a little bit of history about the area and a little bit of insight into this is at least around the area where he goes missing, kind of an industrial type area. Um, so on the map right here, I have the locations of his home and then his work kind of brought up, but let's go ahead and just jump above the work location and turn on the actual satellite view. And of course, keeping in mind, this is modern. So this is, you know, 17 years too recent, but we can see there's a lot of businesses in the area. This is the actual location of the building and, uh, also some open land. Um, so, you know, when we get into search efforts on this, they've definitely got some places to look around here. Uh, thankfully, not a ton of water. There is some water in the area, uh, not a whole lot, but they did do searches also with side scan sonar in particular areas that they identified as, as being interesting or possible leads in this case. And this is John's sister, Stephanie. And I just want to say that Stephanie has been working extremely hard throughout the years trying to raise exposure to this case. And I don't want to take anything away from uh, his brother, Tom. His brother, Tom, is also showing up for all the interviews, uh, opening himself up and, and being part of that process. But Stephanie is really a driving force in terms of the family's perspective in this case. Uh, when she has a strong opinion, she's not afraid to share it. We're going to see that several times in the articles that we're going through here. Uh, this is a woman that's in a lot of pain. These three siblings were very close, had a special bond together. Stephanie describes that one of the things she misses most about John is just kind of his offbeat personality and the, the way that they would laugh at things that just maybe the rest of the world wouldn't understand. 
As a matter of fact, here's Stephanie talking about the last time that she spoke to him. Um, their mother was going through a medical procedure and basically John had been out there um, to see her through that. Stephanie's last words to her brother were, I'll see you in 10 days. After visiting his sister and mother in Phoenix, Arizona, Spyro was flying back home to Chicago. He had planned to return to Phoenix the next month to celebrate McNeil's birthday. That's his sister's birthday. Instead, 10 days later, she flew to Chicago. Her brother, 45-year-old Spira, had disappeared. Uh, let's get over to the Charlie Project and get some more details on this case. And I always appreciate the composites that Megan does in terms of pulling all these great photos together. Uh, John was last seen at approximately 7 p.m. on February 23rd. We know that is at his workplace. His last cellular phone call was placed around that time. He called a friend to say that he would meet for a dinner date in Oak Brook, Illinois at 8.30. So that's pretty interesting. Um, I don't know if that was the initial call. I, I believe that they had already planned that dinner and maybe this was more of a check-in of like, because uh, the snow had really started coming in hard that night. Um, so I think this was just a confirmation. Yeah, I'll meet you there at 8.30. But we know, okay, his phone call's happening around seven. He's telling his friend, I'm gonna see you in about 90 minutes and he doesn't get there. And we know he's at work at this point. So in terms of last known location, you know, sometimes we look at these cases and we're just like, it, it's so hard to pick up because you don't know where the person was. His vehicle is found at work. What happened? And and once again, just back to that point about the him running off on his own theory, someone would have had to come get him or pick him up or he'd have to get a taxi, something along those lines. Why would he leave the truck behind? Why would he leave all his accounts untouched? There's just a, a lot that doesn't really work with that theory very strongly. He never arrived as scheduled. His cellular phone is known to have been turned on until 11 p.m. Um, what that does give us is a ping map. They didn't have GPS, unfortunately, working back then the same as we do nowadays. Um, but what they're noting here is essentially with a cell phone signal, you'll usually attach to more than one tower. And there's a system that tries to figure out like what's the strongest signal for you to actually place a call. So what they're showing here are several different towers. And this cross section in the middle is basically the area that they could say, okay, his phone was definitely in this spot because of the reach of these towers and, and how it's communicating to them. His workplace is this purple X. You might remember it, it matches the map that we were just looking at. It's close to uh, Route 64 there, uh, or Route 64. So it seems like his phone does not leave that area. If he had gone home, that would have actually bumped him out of the coverage of this uh, Spring Lakes cell tower over here. It, even though his home isn't that far, it's seven miles, it's just enough that it would have taken him out of Spring Lakes cell tower. So his phone seemingly stays at work through all this. John's girlfriend attempted to file a missing persons report for him. The police refused to accept it because she was not a relative. Uh, of course, they wouldn't take it from her. They would take it from his wife. His estranged wife, Suzanne, filed a report on February 25th. So the wife not filing the report for two days. Now, to be fair to her on that, um, the girlfriend was interviewed in the Disappeared episode very heavily. And she even said that she kind of had a rough conversation with John at the end. He wanted her to come out to dinner that night. She had to work for some reason, said, I can't make it. Just, you know find a friend, go have dinner. I'll, I'll catch up with you tomorrow. He was scheduled to play a gig on Saturday night. So she was knowing one way or another, she was going to get to the gig and she was going to see him. So throughout that whole morning, uh, the following morning after he went missing, she didn't hear from him. She was concerned, you know, she's trying to call him, but the phone is just going directly to voicemail. At some point she just says, you know what, I'll, I'll just meet him. Uh, when I get to the bar tonight. I know he's going to be there. He never misses a gig. And his bandmates say this as well. He's never even late. And he has never missed a gig. So to be fair to the wife not filing this initially, it's taking a little bit of time for everyone to kind of catch on that, that something's wrong here. 
They had been married for more than a decade and lived in the same house throughout the divorce negotiations, which took two years. John played guitar with the Rabble Rousers Blue Band at the time of his disappearance. The band was well known in the local area and they performed frequently. He also owned a utility cable company, Universal Cable Construction, veteran of the U.S. Army. He was a tank driver in the Army. Uh, he enjoys electronics, machinery, and building and driving race cars. He is also a licensed pilot, as I mentioned. Interesting thing about the Universal Cable Construction Company is essentially they connect sites underground. So if you have two buildings, maybe you've got buildings that are across the street from each other and you want to get them wired up so they could share a network or share a phone system or something like that, you would hire this type of company to come out, survey the area, decide how they were going to dig to actually, or tunnel to get that line laid. They come in and do all that. And then you can get those two build buildings connected up. Uh, what's interesting about that is a few things. First of all, it just kind of speaks to his love of machinery, which is part of what got him into driving tanks when he heard that, you know, he could handle those giant machines. It just grabbed his attention as, as a young man, and he kind of rolled that into his professional career. But it also brings up this question of him last being seen at work and the type of equipment that would be available if it was someone from work that did something to him in terms of being able to hide a body somewhere. So a lot of troubling things there. I did mention uh, it was snowing. I know that out here when it snows, the ground can freeze and it practically you know, turn into concrete. Um, so that's a big factor that people are talking about in online conversations around this, but they would have had substantial equipment for basically boring into the ground as part of that business. So something to just kind of keep in the back of our minds as we're looking through all this together. This is a picture, a bit more of a current picture of his girlfriend at the time, uh, Renata Bielski's. And we're going to get just some information from her on what happened around this. The last time that Renata spoke to John, they talked about going out to eat. They didn't get to go to dinner. She was still finishing up at work and she wasn't able to get away. And of course, we know no one has seen or heard from him since that day. I'm hopeful he's still alive, she says. You need to keep it in the public eye. She had been dating Spira at the time of his disappearance. He and his wife, Suzanne Spira, were going through a divorce. And they have some comments from Suzanne here, which quite honestly, she really kind of buttons up very quickly. These are, I think, the only comments that I've been able to find publicly from her. I hope and pray for my husband's safe appearance, she says. I have no idea what could have happened. What occurred on that day was atypical of John's routine. And that's about it. In the Disappeared episode, they wouldn't even show her. Um, there has been some coverage since. Crime Watch Daily has done a update on this case as of 2017. Uh, they showed several pictures of her, so we do have some pictures that are publicly available that we can review. Um, this is her, but there's kind of an interesting turn that's going to happen with her in terms of this case as well. Getting back to Stephanie trying to raise exposure to this case. We, we're a few years down from his disappearance now. Missing brother leaves sister wondering what happened. The loss of a loved one is a horrific tragedy, one that we talk about way too frequently. But for Stephanie McNeil, what's worse is not knowing what happened to her big brother, John. It's torture. It's serious torture every day I think about him. McNeil is certain that her brother met with foul play. He had a $500,000 life insurance policy and Google stock that she thinks is worth millions. Spiro was last seen at his office by his business partner, she said. Less than an hour later, he didn't appear for dinner with some friends, and by 11 p.m. that evening, his phone, which wasn't used, was turned off or the battery died. The next night, he didn't appear at a blues club where he was supposed to play, and then his estranged wife was finally convinced by Spira's girlfriend to make a missing persons report. His truck was found parked at his office, and it appears that nothing was missing or taken. But there were no physical clues for police who, according to McNeil, didn't believe that foul play was involved. They made up their minds that he did it voluntarily, McNeil said. The local police in Illinois at one point told her that he was probably in Tahiti getting drunk. And that just made me so mad, she said. I don't know how you could be um, so light with a family member facing that. 
And I do try to keep in mind a lot of these cases solve themselves in a matter of days. And maybe that was just a comment made in those early hours and they were trying to keep it light to maybe help the family relax a bit, thinking that John was going to walk in the door in a matter of minutes or hours. But unfortunately, that's not what happened here. Uh, jumping over to a blog real quick, Susan Milano um, says that she actually spoke to Stephanie and said that it was no surprise to learn that John and his estranged wife were going through a nasty divorce. She initially filed, then changed her mind. John had enough and he was ending the marriage. That very morning, the financial terms of their divorce were agreed upon by the parties and a tentative date was set to be to finalize the divorce. But by the end of the day, John is never seen or heard from again. There are also financial issues within the cable construction business and strains on the partnership. And we're not going to get a ton of detail in terms of what's going on with the business relationship, but I'm curious just about what could have been negotiated with his wife in terms of the business. And would that have impacted his partner in some way that maybe he got upset? Maybe there was some type of argument. Maybe things went a little too far in the office, something along those lines. It's really hard to look at this case and not be focused on where he was last seen, his vehicle being left behind there, and he's there with his business partner. I mean, this almost sounds like an episode of Law and Order or something like that. I mean, you know, don't we all kind of have that checklist in our minds about like, oh, significant other, probably them. Nope. Who else is going to benefit? Follow the money. Business partner? Sure seems like something that simple here, but here we are 17 years later and this case is still open and this family still doesn't know where John is. And then we have this happen. Missing man's business burns. And this actually happened only a matter of months after he went missing, about seven months after he went missing. Investigators used a crane to pick apart the burned remains of Universal Cable Construction. The company was co-owned by John Spira, 45, a local blues guitarist known for playing under the stage name Chicago Johnny. When firefighters arrived on the scene, the building was fully engulfed in flames. Black smoke was so thick it obscured the traffic signals. The fire gutted the building. The roof collapsed and one wall partially collapsed. The fire was dangerous because there were acetylene tanks in the business. Most were removed, but one exploded, the chief said. Some other information that came from, I believe, from the family was there apparently was a bunch of ammunition that was stored here as well. It seems that the business partner was into hunting. Um, actually, the business partner and someone else. There's an office manager that has been mentioned in some of the social media on this story. They've never been named in the press from what I can see, so I'm going to follow suit with that. Um, but it kind of brings up this situation where you've got three people that are working together. And for me, it just brings up that question of like, oh, well, if a few people are going to benefit, would they possibly work together against the third person? Um, it seems like there's some thoughts run running down that avenue. I don't know how strong they are. And like I said, I haven't seen it officially reported, so I'm not going to lean on it too much. But I do believe that the business partner and this office manager actually like to go hunting together and knowing that there's ammo um, that's actually giving the firefighters trouble because they're they're hearing, you know, like the bullets going off. So they're not running in to work on this fire. Um, that raises the question, are there weapons that are at this location as well? Now, it was searched by police and it was searched a few days after he went missing. So if there was anything like that, I think it would have likely been noted in the police records. But of course, if we are talking about a foul play situation where it was someone in that business responsible, they would have likely removed anything that was important evidence. Um, so law enforcement probably wouldn't have found it. But let's continue with these details. Uh, McNeil said the fire happened a day after a sign soliciting tips about Spira's disappearance was torn down. The sign, a banner 20 feet by 5 feet, was stretched between large wooden beams and supported by 2 by 4s So the disappeared episode does go into this a little bit, and I believe they describe that there's actually two signs. There's one sign that's put up, it's there for one night, and it literally gets taken down. So the family 
first of all, is like, what's going on with that? But let's be honest. I don't think it's an accident that the family's putting up a sign there. I mean, it makes sense. Logically, that's where his vehicle is. That's where he was last seen. Like, yeah, you want people in that area, people that are driving by, maybe they notice something, people that work in that area, maybe they know something. It makes sense at that level. But I also think maybe there was some suspicions. Maybe that helped motivate some of this from the family's perspective about like, well, let's get permission from a property owner across the street. Let's go ahead and put up a sign and just kind of have it face the workplace. Um, well, the first sign gets tore down. They go back, they put up kind of a stronger sign, a bigger sign that seemingly disappears the following night. And then the day after that, all of a sudden the building burns down. What are the odds that these are coincidences? Well, first of all, the signs being taken down, that's certainly not a coincidence. The only thing I'm bummed about is that someone didn't think, especially because they had that experience with the first sign disappearing. Let's put a camera on this. Let's go ahead, build up a new one, but let's, let's just run a little camera on it. Now, admittedly, you know, cameras are much easier to kind of place and hide and all that good stuff nowadays because of how small they are. And we are talking about 17 years ago, um, but I don't think it would have been impossible. I mean, they had permission from the property owner. If there was any kind of building, they could have, you know, gotten some type of camera system uh, laid in there, but you know, the family's not thinking like that. They're not thinking that there's possibly someone working against their efforts to find their missing loved one. I mean, why would you, even in that situation? So we have some strangeness going on around the business, but we've also got this soon to be ex-wife kind of in the fold and some actions on her part that might make you wonder twice about her. Over at patch.com, in the weeks following his death, Suzanne tried to have John's amplifiers appraised at a local music store, according to the family's blog. An employee refused and reported the incident to police. By September of 2007, Suzanne had sold all of the couple's belongings and moved to New York, according to Spira's family. The family also theorizes Suzanne could have collected a large sum of money from a life insurance policy if Spira was declared dead. Which is interesting because I don't know that he has been. I haven't run into any information that even up to now he's been declared dead, which is pretty strange. Usually in these missing persons cases, especially ones that have elements like this, somewhere around the seven year mark, uh, families push and are typically able to get their missing loved one declared dead, seven to 10 in some cases. Um, so I'm curious about that. I'm also curious about Suzanne's level of involvement because this doesn't seem to be helping her, him disappearing. If he was found deceased, then it would certainly help her because the divorce isn't finalized. So whatever they negotiated, forget that. Everything's practically gonna, gonna roll to her unless he has uh, a written will and some of it's going to other family members or stuff like that. But most of it is going to go to her. Um, that life insurance policy, I would say there's probably a pretty good chance that she was the beneficiary on it. He might've changed that. They had been separating for two years, so maybe she wasn't any longer. I'd be curious to know that I'm, I'm actually, I'm surprised that information hasn't come out publicly that someone has been like, you know, oh, we looked into it and the beneficiary was actually rewritten a year before that. So she wouldn't have benefited, but it's just, it does raise an interesting question that is this the best outcome for her? Like, I get that there's a mentality that they're both living in the house together, so they both must love the house. Well, from what I see, the house actually goes into foreclosure pretty soon after he goes missing. So it doesn't seem like she really got to keep the house. Um, wouldn't it have been better for him to still be around producing money that she was going to be getting a part of? Because all of a sudden he disappears yeah, there's business interests. Now she's collecting half of whatever the business is doing, I assume, for however long that's going to run, which I'm not even sure if it's still currently active. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't know. It's it's one of those situations where I, I'm not sure what the benefits are for her, unless it's literally just anger. Um, you know, if, if she is part of this at all, was it just simply because she was so angry at him or something along those lines? And the disappeared episode 
touches on a little wrinkle. We'll, we'll kind of get to it here as we continue through the articles, but um, I'm not sure. 2011. The sister of missing St. Charles man, John Spira, has insisted for years that her brother's estranged wife knew more about his di disappearance than she was letting on. Whether she was right or not, the sister, Stephanie McNeil, will never find out. Suzanne Spira was found dead in her Orchard Park, New York apartment on October 30th. Talk about another bizarre twist in this. The spokesman for the Erie County, New York Health Department confirmed Suzanne Spira's death, but said he could provide no further details. So John's sister said no one from the DuPage County Sheriff's Department, whose representatives claimed to be actively investigating his disappearance, nobody notified her. Quote, it's pretty significant information that John's wife, the person that I've been saying should be a person of interest in the investigation, is dead, and they didn't even know. Even if they did know and didn't tell us, it's shameful, but I really doubt they knew it. In an interview conducted just months before her death, Suzanne Spira denied that her relationship with the husband who wanted to leave her had turned toxic. But McNeil insists it was terrible and says she's certain Suzanne Spira knew what befell her brother. McNeil is feuded with the DuPage County Sheriff's Department over its refusal to classify his case as a homicide. She's been very vocal about that through the whole thing. Thankfully, I can tell you guys that while they're not outright coming, I don't think it's been officially reclassified as a homicide. I can tell you some of the more current comments on it are definitely open to that possibility, considering it heavily, I would say. But it seems like it's taken years to get there. And we're going to see there's one investigator in the middle. I don't I don't know what this guy's thinking. But uh, McNeil requested that the sheriff's department share its investigative files on her brother's death and the fire at his business. The department refused to cooperate. We've heard this before, saying that the records are still part of an ongoing investigative file. Well, his sister doesn't stop there. She actually appeals to the Illinois Attorney General's office and starts trying to get them to overturn that rejection. So we have the Sheriff's Department refusing to be helpful to her in terms of handing over their files and uh, effectively stonewalling her claim, her FOIA request, by saying that the case is active and open. Here we have Patch actually asking the question, but is it? In the four years following Spira's disappearance from the cable construction company he co-owned, McNeil said the police have not tried to elicit any clues from anyone in her family. Not one time did they call me, she said. They returned my phone calls occasionally. The DuPage County police have only grudgingly spoken with his sister. They've never interviewed his brother. And they waited two years before questioning either his girlfriend or his best friend. And even then, those efforts were only made when the police learned that the Discovery Channel was producing an hour-long show on the case, according to Spira's friends and family. I said, now you're investigating me because of the Discovery Channel show, recalled Spira's best friend, Jim Emma. The DuPage County detective who contacted Emma denied this, Emma said, but was concerned enough about the television program that he asked him not to mention anything about one of Spira's business associates during the broadcast. I wonder who that is. McNeil said her brother was also on the outs with his business partner, David Steuben. Spira borrowed a large sum of money from the cable construction company that he co-owned with Steuben, McNeil said, and his partner was upset and angry about it. Steuben has failed to respond to messages left on his cell phone and at his home over the last month. The business office Spira and Steuben shared burned down within a year of Spira's disappearance. The DuPage County Police will not share information on their investigation of the fire with McNeil. Strangely, the two people possibly bearing the most ill will towards Spira at the time of his disappearance were the same pair that police primarily relied on for information and direction, according to Stephanie, John's sister. Now, John's family did notice some things that made it seem to them like maybe David Steuben and Suzanne Spira were working together in some way. They said that David was calling her regularly. I even heard some comment about that David had to leave to go help and shovel snow at their at Suzanne's house. Um, 
of course, you know, with John disappearing, there would be some connectivity happening there because all of a sudden Suzanne is stuck with all these house payments and all that stuff. And it's John's business. So it would make sense that there would be some type of contact between the two of them for like, Hey, you know, um, I've got house payments I got to make, you know, what's figure out John's paycheck and then start giving it to me. Cause I got to keep this stuff floating here. Um, but it seems like it was a bit more than that. I'm not seeing anything that is pushing into the realm of like maybe possible romantic interests or anything like that. I believe David's actually married at this point, not to say that that couldn't happen, but I'm just saying I'm not seeing anything that's pushing in that direction very strongly, but kind of in that scenario I was talking about before, if you know, you've got three people, could two of them be working with each other to, um, take the interests of the third person in some way, it could be that Suzanne and David might have had some type of agreement. Maybe there was some discussion about like, Hey, you know, if, if John wasn't around all of a sudden you'd get his half of the business and guess how much that is. And, uh, you would have to do that before the divorce. Maybe there was some form of collaboration there. I know it's something that the family has been concerned about. They've been somewhat vocal about that possibility over the years. But uh, let's continue with some more details here. What's bizarre is considering all that, we have investigators do things like this. So Stephanie says that a detective told her, John's done this disappearing thing before and we're done investigating. McNeil, who says her brother was in constant contact with his family throughout his life, asked the detective where he got this information. He told her that he learned it from Suzanne Spira and... Steuben. So kind of supporting the point that she was making that uh, investigators seem to be listening to these two people who have the most to gain in his disappearance, if nothing else. And I would certainly be taking that information with a grain of salt. But um, also in terms of the disappeared episode, Commander Mark Edwards appeared on the program and said that his department was investigating the case as a willful disappearance until there's evidence that point us points us to another theory. And quite honestly, if you do watch the disappeared episode, it's on HBO max. Um, it's, it's also available in other places, but if you do watch it, it's probably one of the more frustrating things. Cause you kind of just keep slapping yourself in the forehead saying, guys, why, why are you thinking this? Like, I mean, or at least show us something that makes sense for that type of thought. Like, oh, we checked his accounts. All of a sudden he pulled several hundred thousand dollars and there, all that's missing. And then he disappeared. Um, but the stuff that Commander Edwards even brings up in the episode doesn't support this. You know, they went and checked for local flights that left there. He didn't fly out of there. They even went and checked for the small aircraft and stuff. They couldn't find any records of him leaving. So it's just, it's really weird to me that they're holding on to these theories so strongly when they don't, they're not finding anything to really back that. And why would, why would that be the default mode in this investigation? It, it always troubles me when we're talking about cases where the missing person has left behind their means of taking care of themselves. None of his accounts are being touched. His cell phone obviously got left behind somehow. His vehicle left behind somehow. He didn't take any personal items at all. I mean, it's just, it's a weird default position to take with a case of this nature. Um, you know, you might analyze it from the standpoint of, well, if, if I don't really want to work very hard on this, then I can just say that's my belief and then I can focus on other things. I don't know. It's, it's really, really frustrating with a case like this. To the point, Stephanie's saying here, stop blaming John for his disappearance. Call this at the very least foul play or better yet, a homicide. Prove to me that you're actually investigating this. And if you can't do that, give me the documents I requested through my Freedom of, of Information Act request so I can investigate this on my own. Don't lie to me and tell me you're investigating it and blow me off. For me, it is very hard to not take that point of view as well, that, that they're blowing her off, especially with that perspective. Oh, he probably left on his own. He's probably in Tahiti sipping on a drink. 
This is David Steuben. Again, thank you to Crime Watch Daily for sharing some of these details in major media so that we can share them here as well. Okay. Missing man's business partner told stories. Uh, that's an understatement. The business partner of missing St. Charles man, John Spira, accused him of racking up massive debt in excess of 1 million and speculated that this prompted him to skip town, according to police reports recently obtained by Patch. Police reports? Yes. That Freedom of Information Act finally got overturned and all of a sudden the records started being made available. David Steuben also theorized that Spira might have been taking money from the business and that he would not rule out that the missing man had something to do with a suspicious fire that gutted the company building nine months after he vanished. I just have to say this is silly. Like the, the, that presumption is silly. Like if we are, are, are trying to go down this thought that um, John left, took off on his own, hey, maybe it was part of this debt. Maybe he, he got that 1 million together and said, okay, now I'm out of here. Then he comes back seven months later to burn down the building. Uh, was there insurance on the building? Yes. Did John get any of that? He's he's missing. He's disappeared. No, he's not going to get any of that. Someone else would. Um, Spira's sister, Stephanie McNeil, has waged and won a six-month freedom of information fight for those records. She said that she has not spoken to Steuben since soon after Spira vanished. She said that Steuben was uncooperative with friends and family concerned with finding her brother. In my opinion, he's got something to hide, she said. There's a bunch of different stories on this. One of them is they were getting ready to do a search and she was asking for his help and he was like, ah, I'm going fishing that weekend. Steuben, 48, was among the last people to be seen with Spira. They were reportedly together the evening of February 23rd, 2007. Steuben reportedly told the police he saw Spira talking to a vendor, Daniel Bernadette, in his office when he left for the night about 7 p.m. So Steuben now saying, I'm not the last person that was with him. I was with him that night, but I left and he was there with this other guy, Daniel. But Bernadette claimed that he actually left before Spira and Steuben. And there's another vendor, Anthony uh, DiStefano, who reportedly said Dave and John were the only two individuals left at the business when he took off. So we've got two independent vendors here that don't know each other, that are basically supporting each other's story. Dave and John were there. Dave and John were alone. Reached by telephone, Steuben refused to discuss Spira's disappearance or the statements attributed to him in these police reports. Uh, he also was interviewed by police. It was videotaped. And he told detectives that he was originally unconcerned because John had disappeared before and that Spira lives a mysterious life. So this might be where some of that information some investigator, you know, heard this quote from Steuben and was like, oh, he's done this before. This guy just disappears on people. This is something he does. He also told detectives that Spira sanitized his office area and threw out several boxes of stuff. He also shredded two big bags of paperwork shortly before disappearing, police said. Now, sanitized his office area? Why? Why? That makes no sense. The only way that makes sense is from the perspective of Steuben. If Steuben had something to do with this, using it as an excuse for why if they went and tried to fingerprint John's desk, they're not going to find John's fingerprints. But in the case of, of John taking off from his life, what benefit is there to that? Zero. There is no benefit to him sanitizing his office area. Why would he do that? It's his office area. His DNA, it, he should be all over that. There's literally no benefit. This, this is an excuse being dropped in the middle of this interview is what it seems like to me. It just really doesn't make sense. 
sanitize his office area. And I'm also, I, I think it's pretty interesting, um, two big bags of paperwork, throwing out several boxes of stuff. Like if you have a business partner trying to pull something over on you, you've probably got contracts about what your business agreements are and things like that. All of a sudden that stuff goes missing maybe. Or if you've got a, a crooked business partner that's embezzling something like that, the receipts that could actually help prove that disappearing, being shredded. I don't know. These actions really, really stick out. Detectives asked Steuben to submit to a polygraph, to which he reportedly replied that he wanted to talk to an attorney before taking the test. He advised that he would contact his attorney and get back with us at a later time. Since this interview, Dave has never contacted me regarding the polygraph, as he previously stated, nor has he called to inquire about the status of the case. So not only being helpful, also just doesn't care about what's happening with it. When detectives paid Suzanne Spira a visit two weeks after John was last seen, she acted somewhat suspicious to say the least, according to police reports. Suzanne appeared nervous and upset. And within a couple of minutes into our conversation, Suzanne stated without prompt or being asked that she was being honest with me about not knowing where John was. She stated that some people lie and can't keep their stories straight, and she will tell me the same story 20 times and it will never change. Due to the infancy of the investigation, I did not pursue the obviously strange out-of-place statement the detective wrote in the report. Three months later, according to a report, Suzanne Spira told the police she and Steuben were in touch two to three times a week since John's disappearance. Dave has continued to provide Suzanne with John's weekly paycheck in order for her to take care of the monthly bills. And like I said, there's a certain amount of that that, that makes sense. But some of the other stuff the family was saying, it it's a little it crosses into a, a little a little more friendly than that. But also along those lines, these are guys that have known each other for 20 years. Um, they've been in business together for 17 years at this point. So, you know, taking care of, of uh, your partner's um, affairs in that way, or, you know, going to help their wife out when he's gone missing. Like it would be a lot easier to buy if he was also being helpful in the search efforts and being helpful with law enforcement, but we're not quite seeing that. Uh, as with Steuben, the police asked Suzanne to take a lie detector test. She replied by saying she saw no reason for her to take it. In May of 2007, police said Suzanne Spira's lawyer left a phone message with a detective that she would be skipping a meeting with investigators and she was not going to allow us to enter her house. Oh, goodness. So just a little blurb from the old johnspira.com website put together by the family. The last person to see John alive was his friend and business partner of 20 years, David Steuben, at 7.15 at their office. John's car never left the office parking lot. John and Dave were having serious financial issues at the time of John's disappearance. Whatever happened to John could have only have happened between 7.10 and 7.45, a very short time frame. I assume they're thinking that because... He probably had a certain amount of drive time for him to get to that restaurant where he was going to meet with the person. When DuPage County and St. Charles Police initially investigated the matter in the early morning hours of Sunday, the 25th, John's employees at Universal Cable officially reported a large piece of heavy-duty plastic sheeting material missing from the premises. Dave, the last person to see John alive, has refused a lie detector test and will not speak to the police. Why? So... We're talking industrial strength plastic material. Um, and in the disappeared episode, they made it seem like it was an entire roll of that stuff that's missing. This is an evidence photo from Crime Watch Daily. It's, it's the same plastic material. They were using it to try to stop some of the cold air from coming in. So that's why it's hanging here in a doorway. But we're talking like very thick plastic material and... It's weird. I don't know if it's a whole roll that's missing or a section because I've seen other things that are saying 10 feet by 20 feet of it is missing. But regardless, we have employees that are like, oh, hey, we had two rolls of this plastic that we bought and now there's only one there. Certainly makes me very concerned about what's happening. And 
Another interesting point is the vehicle that was found. Now, law enforcement says that they actually checked it. They didn't see anything suspicious, but they also checked it for prints and they didn't find any. Now, once again, is that part of that excuse that David dropped about did, did John supposedly go and wipe down his vehicle to remove his prints from that also? Uh, or is it just kind of an oversimplification from the investigator's statement? Did he mean that they didn't find anything out of the norm, that they did find John's prints in there? But also um, the parking area was off. Essentially, John was known to park in front of the building and we can see that his vehicle is actually parked in kind of a locked area behind the building. Um, what's interesting about this is you can also see that it's been parked there a while because the snow has fallen on top of the vehicle and you can see under the vehicle is all clear of snow. Um, the family says that this was actually moved after he went missing. That basically the night he was still there, his vehicle was parked in the front. He goes missing that night. At some point over that weekend, this vehicle gets moved to this kind of private locked up parking area and who usually parks in this spot? It's David Steuben's parking area. Five years later, little known about Spira's disappearance. I should say little new information known because there's a lot of information that we're covering here. Uh, Spira's sister, Stephanie, said, I thought we'd have some answers by now. I definitely have my theories and ideas of who's responsible. To keep Spira's name out in public view, she today will unveil a new billboard asking for tips and information related to the disappearance. That sign will be in the same location as the old sign. This family has not given up. I don't want people to forget, she said. This story needs to remain in the public eye. DuPage County Sheriff John Zerba stated, Sheriff's detectives are still seeking the public's assistance in their continuing investigation into locating John Spira. And uh, McNeil says that she doesn't hold out much hope over finding her brother's body. I hope we do so we can have a proper funeral for him, she said. But she does hope that justice will be served if it's determined that Spira was murdered. I want the people responsible to know they just can't rest, she said. Now, what about the fire? Because the family was initially hoping like, okay, if these things are connected, now we have someone that's committed arson and that has to be investigated and hopefully they will be found and any connections to John's disappearance could maybe then pop up. Is it arson or not? Well, the family asked about that early on and they were basically told that, hey, these investigations can go on for years, sometimes decades. Um, we do have an update here. I think this is as of 2014 over at the Huffington Post. According to the DuPage County Fire Investigative Task Force, the fire investigation is still an open case. Despite the classification of the fire or lack thereof, McNeil said that she finds the fire extremely suspicious and believes it's connected to her brother's disappearance. I don't know how you wouldn't believe that. Um, I mean, I, I know, you know, always keep yourself open to all possibilities, but come on, like with the sign disappearing the same weekend. As the months turned into years, McNeil found herself making dozens of trips to Chicago. She diligently distributed flyers, organized searches, and held vigils to raise awareness. McNeil worked with several missing person search and recovery groups, including Texas EquiSearch. She helped create the johnspira.com site and a Facebook page, which is still active. I have a link to that in the description box down below. She also helped get her brother onto that episode of Disappeared. Most recently, she contacted Clear Channel and asked if the company would help spread awareness about her brother, and they said, sure, we'll do it. They put up 14 billboards, and she says, I'm so grateful a company like that is willing to help after all these years. It's pretty amazing. It certainly is. Uh, Spira's estranged wife, Suzanne Spira, moved to Buffalo, New York following his disappearance, and here we at least get some explanation, because I'm sure you guys were curious about it when you heard she passed away only a number of years after that. Was she being silenced in some way? According to this, she died of natural causes in October of 2010. Um, now, there was one other wrinkle around her possible involvement, and it actually goes back to the original disappeared episode. And it's weird because I haven't 
seen any of the other coverage on this case really touch into this too much, except for this one little blip here at CBS News. So basically, Stephanie winds up hiring a private investigator, Matthew Hale, former police officer, now private investigator, hired by McNeil. Quote, the person I'm most interested in speaking to right now is Heather, and that's the daughter of John's former wife. John Spira's former wife is now dead. Hale believes the daughter may know something. In the Disappeared episode, they talk about an instance that kind of broke the marriage between John and Suzanne, which was, they, they describe it as John's stepdaughter. So I'm not 100% sure if that is Heather, um, but it would seem like it based on what Matthew Hale is saying here, the daughter of John's former wife. Um, she apparently killed her boyfriend. And there was a trial going on for that. And Suzanne moved out to Buffalo, New York to be there through that whole trial. And John was going out there and being supportive. And apparently that was kind of a point where the marriage just really heavily disintegrated. It's interesting to me that Matthew thinks that Heather might have some information in terms of John's disappearance. Um, but perhaps, I mean, I don't, I don't know, like, you know, how close are mothers and daughters and uh, would there be some reason for Suzanne to have told Heather about what was happening if she was involved in this in some way? Um, perhaps. So it's it's curious to me. Unfortunately, I don't hear anything else about Matthew Hale in any of these articles. I'm not sure how long he worked as PI on this case. And this thread really goes nowhere. Um, however, in the social media circles, I could see people leaving comments just about that episode of disappeared. Like some people think that the, the stepdaughter is the one that did it, which I don't think is possible based on what they laid out in that. But you know how people are. We, we see the cast of characters in the one episode and we're trying to decide who's the most likely person to have done it. So, um, and interestingly in that episode of disappeared, they really didn't go into David Steuben a whole lot, if at all. And like I said, even for Suzanne, they, they blurred all of her images. Um, so I don't know. Sister of Missing St. Charles Man says, predatory grifter tried scamming her for reward money. Uh, a terrible thing that we see happens. It's kind of, it's, it's the bad side of getting this level of exposure, right? Because you have this on Disappeared. It is also covered on America's Most Wanted. And with that, you get people that are looking into these cases and trying to think how can they profit in some way on them, which I think is sick. Stephanie McNeil was contacted through Facebook by a woman claiming to be from New Zealand. I believe that you're looking for your brother. And I believe there is a $10,000 US reward for anyone that finds him. The woman identified as Karina Coogan said in the message, could you please let me know what the exact terms of the reward are? Sorry to sound so mercenary. I am not, but I'm sick of people saying they offer rewards and then not pay out on them. I have found John, Coogan wrote. The comparison picks have been looked at by a panel of people who do believe it is your brother too. You won't find him easily, I can tell you that. But consequences are consequences. I told you I don't deal with disrespectful people. Uh, triggering language all over this and outside of that um, comparison picks like this sounds like this is someone that's literally si sitting on Facebook with a picture of John's um, uh, missing poster on one side of their screen and then scrolling through Facebook and looking at pictures of people and saying oh I think that's him I think that's him this to me sounds like someone that is kind of fantasizing about like hey wouldn't it I mean, there's like a new TV show that's kind of about this, right? Where the guy only works for rewards on missing persons cases, um, which I don't think is a real thing either. I don't know. I don't know what's going on with this, but it's just, it's angering to know that these families are already dealing with so much and now they have to deal with this. Thankfully, um, Stephanie did not buy into it at all. She said she knew she was dealing with a fraud after receiving the first message. I was incredibly really angry, she said. Thankfully, True Crime Daily recovers the story in 2017, and we hear that we now have some people looking at it that are much more open to the foul play situation. We have a comment here from Sergeant Bob Harris of the DuPage County Sheriff's Office. Certainly, whenever an adult who has what we would consider a fairly successful life 
has a girlfriend, has family, has no obvious reason to disappear on his own, certainly we think right away foul play could be involved here. I am really happy to hear that we have that type of perspective finally working on this case. Although Dave and Suzanne are still on detective's radar, a piece of John's life unknown to many takes them in a very different direction. We had learned that John had a couple of other romantic involvements with other women, said Detective Harris. Certainly in those situations, and at least one we know was married, there's an obvious, the romantic angle of, you know, a spurned or a jealous husband could have been involved. We have attempted to pursue them and unfortunately run into other roadblocks with people not wanting to talk to us. I mean, look, this is a guy that he was separating from his wife for two years, but he was effectively single. For him to be dating other people doesn't seem like out of the realm of possibility. And even being open to this, sure, maybe this is a situation where someone was following him. Maybe it was someone that waited outside until he left work. And then, you know, by gunpoint, get into the car, something along those lines. Sure, it's it's a possibility. They open all kinds of stuff when they start really getting into um, the social life of these people. And we know this is a guy that, like, he hung out of bars, you know? He had a bar, a favorite bar, like, right across the street from work where he would go and hang out. Um, And he just, he liked the bar life that was part of the musician thing. Like, this is a guy that would go work his butt off put in a hard day's work and then go and uh, honestly, I don't know how he does it. Like staying out until the middle of the night and then being up the next morning for work is not something I could do like that. But this, this was the life he had put together for himself. So for him to, you know, be involved with other people, meeting other people, especially going through a period where he's coming out of a marriage, of course, John's brother, Tom believes all roads lead back to Dave Steuben and Suzanne, who he says actually conspired to get rid of John and says money was their motive. It solved Suzanne's problem because I don't think she wanted to get the divorce, said Tom. Look at the house they lived in. Look at the income he had. She had a very, very healthy lifestyle. The divorce was going to end that. And I think she was going to do everything that she could to hold on to that institution. And she shared this information with Dave. And Dave said, well, We think his half of the business is probably worth X and you'd get that income or whatever deal they seem to have made. I would, I would think this is a possibility also, except for I'm just flabbergasted that the house goes into foreclosure. Um, so she didn't get to keep the house, uh, and it did before she moved. So I don't know whatever the plan was, if there was a plan that launched all that, I don't think it played out. Uh, in the way maybe that it was that it was supposed to. I don't know. And then, of course, we have the company going up in flames. Uh, and an update on that. The fire was eventually ruled by the Fire Investigative Task Force as an incendiary fire, which basically means that the fire had human involvement. So someone set this fire at Universal Cable. We just don't know who, and we don't know why. Uh, and... Detective Harris says, I think in law enforcement, we're almost famous for saying we don't believe in coincidences. We can't say if they're related or not, but certainly for us, it's odd. Also answering the question, was there an insurance payout for that building? Detective Harris says there was. They ended up settling for, I believe it was approximately $700,000. So who would have gotten that? Um, Possibly both of them. Possibly both of them. I think maybe Dave and Suzanne. Reportedly, Dave Steuben took that money and rebuilt on the exact site where the building originally stood. But since then, it's been empty, never used, rented out, or occupied. Universal Cable Construction has been operating out of another location since the fire. Um, I actually have a photo of the rebuilt building. Now, it's interesting they say it's never been used because, well, this is from March 22. Uh, And the building, from what I can see, was sold in 2020. But I do believe they were renting out the parking lot space, um, basically to people that would have long-term parking needs, like, you know, rental trucks and things like that. Uh, There's a sign for it in some of the later years, and you can see, like, big um, trucks and trailers and stuff that are being stored back there. So I think he was making some kind of money on it through this, but the actual building, and here's a sign for it, you know, outdoor storage available. Uh, Apparently the building was not used 
until it was sold in 2020. It's considered a missing persons case, said Detective Bob Harris. Certainly, it has suspicious circumstances. They asked him, but do you think John Spira is alive? And Detective Harris says no. Detective Harris also mentions another location they would like to look at. Apparently, Dave Steuben co-owns a property, and I'm not 100% sure, but the other owner of that property might be the office manager I was talking about earlier. That I'm not 100% on that. Uh, but he does co-own a property in Missouri. It's about 110 acres, and investigators would like to search there. But he's refusing to allow a search on that property. Unfortunately for us, the fact we can't talk to him, even with an attorney present, kind of puts us between a rock and a hard place, says Detective Harris. I would basically describe him as a brick wall. He's in our way. If he helped, he would be alongside of us. But by not helping, he's in the way. And of course, we do have to note, Dave Steuben never been charged with anything related to the disappearance of John Spira. True Crime Daily also chased him down as they sometimes do, and uh, tried to get him to speak. And it's the usual result that we see on that. He's covering his face and jumping into a car and nothing else really comes of it. Detective Harris kind of staying open to all possibilities, but he sounds like he's looking in the right direction. Um, in 2020, there would be another detective on this case. And uh, he basically says officially, it's still a missing persons case, but it is presumed to be a homicide. So it might have taken a number of years and a lot of effort on the family's part. But thankfully, I think they finally got it across the line and, and have law enforcement looking at this in, in the right way. Uh, there is a Facebook group. I will have a link to it down below. It's Missing John Spira and a post from last week here. It's been 17 years today since John went missing, was murdered. 17 years and still nothing. No answers. I'm hoping that Sheriff Mendrick of the DuPage County Sheriff's Department will assign a new detective to this case and do some deep diving. At least they're calling this a homicide now, according to the last detective, as opposed to a missing person case. It's unfathomable that all these years have gone by with nothing, despite so much effort. Why are people protecting the guilty party? Of course, there are people who know what happened. I'll never understand how anyone can keep a secret like this for so long, knowing that people have and continue to suffer. Shame on you. If nothing else, I can only hope that somehow this secret is eating away at those who know and have failed to come forward. More than that, I'll never, ever understand how anyone could have hurt and murdered John. He was nothing but kind-hearted. All he wanted to do was play his music and be happy. As the years go by and the initial shock is worn off, the anger, frustration, sadness, and pain still remain. Tommy, John, and I were supposed to grow old together, and we got totally ripped off. And not because of some natural cause or an accident, someone took his life and stole him from us. They stole him. John doesn't know his amazing nephews, Cole and Nolan, and they didn't get the chance to know him. Our mom died not knowing what happened. There is just so much loss here, it's difficult to put into words. I simply can't believe we still don't know. It sucks. You can really feel for Stephanie in those words. Um, like I mentioned, the Disappeared episode available on Max, um, the True Crime Daily episodes available on YouTube, links to those in the description box down below. Healthy conversation going on at Web Sleuths. It has slowed down over the past few years. Maybe it's time to pick that back up. So if you want to join in a good, respectful conversation, as always, I recommend Web Sleuths or that comment box down below. We can do that here as well. I uh, can't tell you how much I feel for this family. Um, this is one of those cases where everything is so strongly focused in one direction that I do believe we need to stay open to the other possibilities, but I can completely understand how frustrating it's been for the family with the things that they've been hearing. And I feel like the newer investigator that's been added might be taking a bit of a diversion. He's kind of talking about 
um, other people that John might have been engaging for business interests or maybe people John was loaning money money from, things like that. I, I don't know how strong that is in this type of situation. Like we know where he was last seen. We have multiple witnesses confirming he was there. We've got some discrepancy in terms of who he was last with, but we know he was there and his vehicles found there. Um, outside of the situation I described, like uh, around the potential jealous husband where maybe he was abducted as he's leaving the building, everything is just really pointing to that office, especially when you consider what happened with that office in the following months. So I really hope there is some new movement on this case really soon. And I hope that Stephanie and Tom get the answers that they've been working so hard for, for all these years now. A big thank you to everyone that supports our work here at the channel. We can't do it without you, especially running it with limited commercials like we do. I want to thank PayPal supporters, Tabitha Tyndall, Hillary Green, and Amanda Beard. If you'd like to support our work here, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Desiree Mendez recently did. We really appreciate your support to help us keep the ads down on these presentations as we try to raise exposure to these cases and help as many different families as we can. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Take care, stay safe, and I'll see you back here next week on the Lord and Arts channel.